Tonight's classic movie is a film based on a novel by one of our most popular and successful writers. It's also directed by one of our most successful directors, himself a novelist. Made in 1997, the film is a story of a boy who lives in his own fantasy world in order to escape the harshness of his reality. The film is The Butcher Boy, based on the novel by Patrick McCabe, directed by Neil Jordan and is the choice of Ruth Barton, Barton, who's with me in studio now. Francie is the, well, is he sort of the butcher boy of this title? Uh, explain who Francie is. Francie Brady is, you just can't tell, is he an innocent victim who everything goes wrong for? Or is he a psychopath from the moment he's born? He's born. And one of the, the great things about this film is it never, it keeps you on his side for so long, much longer than a, a, a kind of conventional movie would. But he is, as you said, he's a child of this family. The family is, is dysfunctional, but not outrageously dysfunctional, kind of moderately, modestly dysfunctional. Father's an alcoholic, played by Stephen Ray. Um, and, the, and the mother is heading for a breakdown. And this is, the breakdown is one of the points where his confusion begins to increase because he misinterprets the word Francie misinterprets his mother's breakdown to think she's been taken to the garage and there's a large amount of misunderstanding about her breakdown and being taken to the garage and at that point he's you can see he's a kind of quirky lively boy and he's got three obsessions of which one is British comics and the other is um, American TV westerns and the third is this family the Nugents and this is going to be his downfall the, the Nugent family well, here he is, meeting Mrs Nugent and her son, Philip, and making sure that they pay what he calls the pig toll tax. Now, the thing about Mrs Nugent is, she came back from England with all these airs and graces and walked around as if she owned the town. But here's one little pig that's going to teach her different. Ah, oh, there you are, Mrs Nugent. And Philip. It's just every bad Of course, but that'll be a shilling. A shilling? Yeah. What are you talking about? And half of Philip's, and there's one shilling for you and six pounds for Philip. All together, one and six. One and six, please! Heaven, so you don't have to pay money to go buy it. Yeah, sorry, Mrs. Stooge, but a tax is a tax. And you don't pay it. It's not going to be fair to everybody else, is it? Tax? What are you talking about, tax? The pig told tax, Mrs. Nugent. I worked to do. I can't sit about here all day. So come on now. One shilling plus six pence. Did you know that we hope that'll stop all this nonsense? Tell you what, Mrs. Nugent. I let you go this time. But you remember now in future, you make sure you have that pig toe tax ready. Now you ain't fooling, Mrs. Nugent. See, on one level, you have that terribly threatening language coming from Eamon Owens playing Francie Brady there. Stunning, stunning performance. And at the other level, you have this almost, you know, the, the bassoon music going underneath to tell us this is a comedy. Yes. And it is. I mean, that's that's funny. And and there's the, you're really laughing at the beginning, and even up to the end, you could be laughing if you, by this stage, fairly radically misinterpreted what's going on. Because he does some terrible things. He does some terrible things o on the Nugents, as he says, and um, and all the time you have also kind of this ironic voiceover, which which we heard at the beginning too, which is Stephen. So you've got a slightly comic. Stephen Ray plays his father. But he also is the voiceover of, of, of the story. So the narrator is the adult child, but he's also the father, who's Stephen Ray. Do you think that um, Neil Jordan, by, by setting the, the film up in that fashion that you have Stephen Ray doing both parts, if you like, was he making some point about the, the split nature of the, the personality of Francie anyway? Yes, I think so. And I think, of course, he's making a much wider comment on Irish society, as the book is. I mean, the, the film is quite close to the book. If you like the book, you're going to like the film. Um, and it's it's probably about a society that hasn't grown up. This is one of the things about the society. It's full of kind of half-formed people who are on the outside are normal, but on the inside are really dysfunctional. And so you've got that split between the, the appearance and, and the reality. One of the people, I suppose, in some ways that fits into that, you know, did they ever quite grow up or what is the reality and what is the appearance is the character of Uncle Allo. Explain who he is and, and why he's so important in Francie's development. Uncle Allo is the, uh, the brother who's gone to England and done well, according to the, to the film's ostensible narrative, and he's going to come back. And one of, there's an, a, one of the manic sequences of the film is he's Uncle Allo because he's um, Francie's mother's brother. And so Francie's mother starts baking for him. And, and one of the crazed sequences of the film is she bakes and she bakes and she bakes and butterfly cakes and fairy cakes and she bakes and she bakes and it, it all goes crazy. But of course, we realise very early on and actually the, and his father, Stephen Ray, tells us in case we haven't noticed, of course it's a myth. He hasn't done well. He doesn't have a team of ten men under him. He's a sad immigrant who's just stepped off a bus and is slightly bemused by the whole 
the party that's been thrown for him. However, Uncle Allo has different notions about who he is and how he has succeeded. The sun shot out of Benny Brady for Mrs. Thompson. Oh, oh, I love her. She used to call them. And I love her. I fucking love her. Hello. I and he played the trumpet every night of the honeymoon. Is that right, Benny? Well, I dare say I played a few wee tunes. Oh, you yeah, indeed, you did not, not all, but I'd be right, Charlie. Oh, you're right, all right. Look at this here, girls. Look, the poor Benny and myself and Annie were going along the beach, and up comes this fella. Two and six. Two and six is the man, and you can be king of the jungle. <laughs> well, I tell you, girls, you've never seen the like of it. Benny here with his head stuck out through the cowboy hole, and the body is tossing on him. And he was shouting, I'll get you, McGloom, he said. I'll get you, McGloom. I'll get you, McGloom. Trudeau, you the Tarzan's buddy. Some Tarzan, no. <laughs> some Tarzan, some Jim. <laughs> oh, man, it was the best holiday me and me ever spent. Do you know that? And for you pair of tricksters to come along on your honeymoon, we'll never forget it, Benny. And there you get the opposite, if you like, from the first clip we listened to, where you have this great party going on and lots of fun, but the sinister music in underneath it. So it's that mix again. That's right, and that's, that's a kind of... We don't know, but that's a key memory, this, this memory of Bandoran, because it's a memory about their honeymoon. And, 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 and they, have, they stick their heads through the, one of these kind of joke photographs where you look like you're Tarzan. Um, and, and this is one of the journeys Francie is then going to go on, which is he's going to go back to Bandoran to find that perfect moment when his parents were happy. But then it turns out that it's another fake and they had a horrible honeymoon, and he meets the landlady of the um, B&B that they stayed in. She said, oh, that terrible couple. And it's, it's one of those kind of shattering moments in the film where his childhood innocence, which is constantly being undermined, is, it's really finally ruptured at that point. So all the kind of, as you say, the cheery, cheery stuff and the, mm. the happy, happy community, and they're all having these lovely sing-alongs, and they, um, they sing all these great songs, and there's a wonderful soundtrack to the film. Because the community is just bubbling along, happy, 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 uh, and kind of encircling the tragedy that's taking place within it and not noticing what's going on at the kind of rotten heart of it. This is set in the 1960s, and that's important uh, in terms of the sort of fears that are around at the time, the big one being the end yeah. of the world and communism. That's right, the end of the world and communism and, and the nuclear threat. And, and, so, and there's a great... There's a great sequence where the whole countryside just explodes um, because it's a, it's a kind of surreal fantasy, the film. So, yes, they're all living under this threat. And um, they're also... They ha it all, the film does recreate the iconography of 1960s Ireland as well. So you have the pictures of the Pope and JFK side by side, side on the walls of the houses. Uh, and then you have these farmers driving along in their tractors, fearful that the end of the world has come and checking, has it come? So it's all happening together. And the look of it, in terms of gritty realism that we might expect from the 1960s, this couldn't be further away in how e even the colours that are on the screen in front of us. It's a yeah, real p poster book colours. And in one of the things about the film is that it could have been nostalgic for that period, but it, it just doesn't make it look real to us. So you can never have that kind of kick, nostalgia kick that you get from films set in the past. Francie is sent off, he, he, he beats Philip up, Philip Nugent, who's Mrs Nugent's son, he beats him up and he's sent off to this um, reform school, essentially. Talk to me a little bit about what the sort of a school that he actually goes to and the relationship with Joe that starts to fracture at that time as well. Yeah, Joe's been his best friend, but then Joe starts hanging out with Philip Nugent and that's one of the ruptures, then another of the ruptures in his life. So he behaves extremely badly and he gets sent, as you say, to this uh, reform school. It's kind of like an uh, industrial school in, in a way, which is run by a religious order of male priests. And so... Um, he starts working out in the bogs when he's at the industrial school and it's at this point that has, he has his first vision of the Virgin Mary who, in a masterful stroke of casting, is played by Sinead O'Connor. And this is, I mean, to put Sinead O'Connor as the Virgin Mary who he sees and she's absolutely perfect as the Virgin Mary. She looks, because she's very fragile, she looks just like the Virgin Mary. And this, was the, this is the actor who not that many years previously had torn up a picture of the Pope on uh, Saturday Night Live on BBC Chat says to have her as the Virgin Mary is just incredible. In fact, um, who, Jimmy has texted in to say about this movie, great and beautiful looking movie with a wonderful soundtrack. Sinead's cameo is priceless and, and I will come to Sinead, come back to that because he comes back at the end of the movie in an interesting way. But the, the institution that he goes to himself, uh, that, that Francie goes to, 
How does Neil Jordan and Pat McCabe, who both wrote the screenplay, how do they treat that type of industrial school? Are they harsh on it? They treat it as a joke. Um, what it's, it's so different to say something like the Magdalene Sisters, a song for a raggy boy, which are you know, set a, a really realist films and show the, the excruciating um, abuse that goes on. This film really points up the priest as ludicrous. So it's really saying, how could these people have been in a position of authority? Because they're so incompetent and they're so ludicrous. And then you have, again, another bit of casting. You have Milo O'Shea cast as the abusive priest. But all he really wants to do is dress up Francie in a bonnet and masturbate while Francie talks about his childhood. He's not... I mean, OK, it's abusive, but it's it's treated as... What a stupid thing to do. Dangerous to joke about, though, is it? Oh, terribly dangerous to joke about. But I think by by taking the priest's power away from them in the film, by, by making them such inconsequential people, um, it really undermines the church in a very different way than by setting them up as very powerful. And also it takes away that kind of binary of the good, you know, the very innocent child, the very bad priest, which... I mean, I think, OK, it was nuns in the Magdalene Sisters. It's always been a problem of mine with the Magdalene Sisters. And the nuns are so one-dimensional and so bad that they're unbelievable. Whereas the priests in this are very fallible. It makes them more human and makes them more dangerous, I think. Well, the, the Milo O'Shea character is Father Tiddley, but Father Bubbles, is it Bubbles that is the, the Brendan, Brendan Gleeson, Gleeson character? Brendan Gleeson, brilliant. We'll another hear. brilliant cameo. Oh, now. Oh, so I've seen them all come and go since the very first day I came here as a fresh young curate myself. There's our founder, Fancy, now. Father Cleary. Is it now indeed, Father? Was it him that founded the school for bog men with bony asses, I says? I did, like, fuck. Father Cleary had a saying, no boy is so bad that you can't find a scrap of goodness in him. But what did well, Joe have to take it for? Why, why, why? Why didn't he say, sorry, Philip, you can keep your goldfish, you're nothing to do with us? Then it came to me. Joe only took the goldfish so there would be peace between us all, and when I came home, me and Joe would just carry on the way we had. The devil makes work for idle hands, you see, Flancy. And there's no flitter of badness that good fresh country air and hard work can't cure. And that was the end of the goldfish, because from now on I was going to be good. And if anyone was looking for Francie the Bad Bastard, they wouldn't find him, because he was busy getting the Francie Not a Bad Bastard anymore diploma. And soon I would be out, and where would I be then? Right at the fountain with the one and only Joe Purcell, king of all time. And I see you out there in the bog, Francie, bending your back. I know there's goodness in you. But, Father... Yes, Francie. Do you know what I'd like to do better than cutting turf and grass verges? What, Francie? I'd like to be an altar boy, Father. I wonder, is Francie really going to be good? Another text that's in there. You're discussing my favourite film of all time. An incredible look at the real Ireland, not of the John Hind calendars and postcards. Would you say that this is the real Ireland, Ruth? Yeah, I think so, because I think that by not distracting us with all that nostalgia, uh, as, 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 your, as your texter says, um, the kind of pretty pictorial nostalgia look, it really shocks you into thinking about what was going on. And, and it has that shock effect to it because it, it never lets you off. It, keeps, it plays you, it makes you enjoy the comedy, it makes you enjoy the look, and then something really awful happens and you think, ah, oh, that's the way it was. It does become very, very violent. It becomes extremely violent and it, it becomes relentlessly violent, but it still retains that sense of humour because, I mean, it doesn't give anything away to say he kills Mrs Nugent at the end, but then he buries her body and, and, and um, there's all this, you know, will, when are they going to find it? Will they, won't they find it? And it's extremely comic. The Almost moment. done in a Keystone Cops type of way. Yes, that's right. Hectic, absolutely hectic. Incredible cutting as well, incredible editing in the film. We mentioned Sinead O'Connor as the Blessed Virgin Mary and here is a moment towards the end of the film when she reappears to the old Francie. Ah, Francie, for fuck's sake. That's the best one yet. Sure, how could Joe be gone on you? Aren't you blood brothers? I'm afraid he's gone, missus. They're all gone. Horse Ma, then da, then Allo, now Joe. Gone where? Bondoran. Beautiful Bondoran by the silvery sea, your golden strand charms so grand. You've given me an idea, Mrs. To find out what that idea is. That might be the one reason you're going to give me to go out and get the Butcher Boy out on DVD tonight, or is there another one, Ruth? Well, I, I, 
I don't like making my list of 10 greatest films ever, but were I to make my list of 10 greatest Irish films ever, that's the one I would put at the top. And I think for all those reasons, it's a must-see. <laughs>